gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we are here with another insect under the microscope. Um, I have been chatting with Avea and Susan in the chat, and that has been fabulous. Uh, to give you a little bit of an update, I'm in Michigan now, um, instead, of in instead of in Philadelphia, so we're getting a significant amount of snow. We've I've had to shovel three or four times now, but I made a really adorable snowman, and I was out there giving him a lion's jersey, uh, because we're, you know, doing well this year, and so I was out there giving him a lion's jersey, and I looked down, and it was 15 minutes until I was supposed to be here, so I'm still warming up from being outside, but, uh, that was, um, my little pre-story. Okay, so we are, yeah, he's super cute. Um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll share a picture of him somewhere. Um, so we are looking at a beetle, as it turns out, that is blue and white. So, you know, maybe it's just the time of the year. Um, it, this is a jewel beetle. Uh, they would call him a flat-headed borer. Um, Jewel beetle would be its common name, um, even though that common name doesn't refer to this species, it refers to the entire family of beetles. So some jewel beetles have species um, level IDs. So like the emerald ash borer, when you say that, it's a species of jewel beetle, but we have a common name for it down to species because um, we talk about that species enough. Whereas this is a tropical species of jewel beetle, so it doesn't have its own common name. Um, at least not one that I know. Uh, so this uh, specimen is Chrysochroa castelnaudi. It was collected in Malaysia in 2022. Uh, for those of you who take those notes, um, I have a ruler with me. And the microscope that you're seeing over here, it... Um, that is as zoomed out as I can get, so I cannot go any further. This is a fairly large beetle, so I'm just going to measure it underneath this camera really quick. We're going to say from the front of the head to the end of the abdomen, this specimen is about, I'll go 4.4 centimeters. Um, 4.4 centimeters. That's a pretty good sized beetle. And um, I, uh, I did spread this one. So I opened one of the wings. I opened the elytra on the left side. Um, I thought that that would make it a really fun thing to draw because we can look at the way that the wings open and we can see the wing venation when we look at it under the microscope. And then we get to look at how the wing is functionally tucked underneath the elytra because we can see the other one um, kind of on that side. So I am pretty excited about looking at all of that stuff. And I have purposely not, I've kind of like not peeked yet because I wanted to, uh, you know, view it with you all. So if I was going to go maybe for this measurement because one is open and one is closed, I will go from like the middle of the beetle out to the wing. So then you can call this number would be like half of the wingspan. And you can double it to get the wingspan of the beetle. That's what we'll do. Alright, for the wingspan on our friend, this is about 3.8. Uh, 3.8 centimeters which would make it, what, 7.6 centimeter wingspan if I opened both wings. Beautiful. Now I hope that you all wrote those numbers down. I have to start on my paper, so that might give me two moments to get this um, information down. Hi, 
Isokoa Castle Naughty. Four point four centimeters, that's big. Yes. For sure, a hundred percent very, very large beetle. Alrighty. So um, we're going to start off just getting an overall idea for the uh, the shape of the beetle. So um, we're going to do some pretty light sketching to start off. Um, I know that some of you guys prefer to just start with ink. And maybe um, you give me five minutes to get this sketch lightly. And then we can go and do some, some um, permanent lines all zoomed in. So the front of the head here, you can actually see really well under the microscope. I just want to try and make sure that I leave enough space off to the left of my paper to make sure that I have that, um, that wing open. So let's see. Okay. So for my beetle, we're going to start with, uh, with a D-shaped head. So it's going to be nice and light, kind of straight on the bottom. Nice and rounded. Alright. So we've got a head here. And then for the next segment, that's the pronotum, the first segment of the thorax. Um, it's also where the front pair of legs are connected and the elytra. So right up right here. Um, we're going to start at the base of the head and we're just going to make it slightly wider and then a U on the bottom. And keep in mind, this is just our first... I'm making mine too big! Alright. Sorry guys, I started my, my head too big. I'm gonna split mine in half. Much better. <laughs> All right. I'm going to sketch in the right wing first because that's going to be the one that is that's the one that is straight and I want to get a length first. So, for the um for the elytra, I actually have my ruler right here, so I could just go and double check for us. The length of the elytra is just over three centimeters, so it's like 3.1 or 3.2. Let's see. Whereas the head and pronotum are more like... Yeah, that's about right. So, if you take the length of the head and the pronotum and then you double it, triple it. You'll have to triple it. And then you can get the length of the wings. So if you okay, come here and you go one, two, three. I'm going to double check that really quick. Sorry. That's going to give you the length of the elytra. So from here, the bottom of this triangle, we're going to go all the way down to the end and I want to give it a little bit of a shoulder here. <clears throat> Hi EZL! Welcome! So the shoulder right here on the beetle, you can't see it too well under the microscope just yet, uh, but it is right about here. Uh, we call that the humeral angle, um, that shoulder angle, or you can call it the humerus. Um, is right there the um, the angle on the edge of the elytra. It's going to be um, this one. That's the humerus. Or you sometimes, if they're referring to how sharp the angle is or how dull it is, they'll call it the humeral angle. It's kind of fun. All right, so I am just giving, making sure that it's nice and wide, and I'm going to bring it down. It goes straight most about two-thirds of the way down, and you already have it divided into thirds, which is great. And then at that point, that's when it starts to narrow down 
and come to the end. And so now all we gotta do is take this piece right here. Oh, Eleni, perfect, thank you. Now all we have to do is imagine this elytra right here flipped over and open. So cool. So when the elytra opens, the base, this part right here, is going to turn up. So you've got it starting here and it's going to kind of turn up. <laughs> Let me get an angle on here. And this is why I like to do it in pencil, because right now I'm just trying to get this shape about right. Sorry about going quiet. This is the elytra, E-L-Y-T-R-A, and uh, they are the first pair of be wings of a beetle. And they're the hard ones, so they don't really open and flap, right? They just open, and then they um, they allow the membranous wings underneath to um, unravel. And these are the ones that actually do most of the flying. It's these guys up here that are doing all of the protecting. So now I've got this wing kind of open. I'm going to give myself a really, really light line that's going to show me kind of where... The, uh, the rest of the thorax and the abdomen is coming on down. And then I'm going to hand myself that wing. I'm going to run out of space anyway. All right. I, um, we'll see about what I can do when we zoom in. Maybe I'll shrink some of the features so that I can get that wing to fit. We'll see what happens. All right. So we are all zoomed in on the head already, which I'm a fan of. Get Terry out of the way. They don't need to be there. And we will, we are going to just zoom in on the head. That's what we'll do. Jewel beetles are one of those beetles where their color is structural, meaning that this a very, very beautiful metallic blue color is going to be this color permanently, forever. For a hundred years, this beetle will be this metallic blue color. Um, because it's not a pigment that can fade. What you're looking at here is this little, the little structures on the outside of the exoskeleton. They're like little crystalline structures. And the light will, will hit them and bounce around and come back metallic. Um, so that is what you're looking at there is a, is a structural color. Oh, I see what's happening. Let's see what's happening here. There we are. Okay. So we're looking at the head. These are compound eyes that we're looking at. East Coast is in the house right now. Ha <laughs> Yeah, very good. Structural colors are real colors. That's funny. I love it. Sure. They are tr They are real. They do exist. Is my camera blurry? Maybe I need to give it a little bit of a boost. All right. So we are all zoomed in looking at the head. It has these ginormous compound eyes that we are seeing. On the inside, there's a little bit of these L angles. So I'm going to go about two-thirds of the way up of this D shape here. And I'm going to give it a nice um, kind of eye. It comes in. It comes in at an angle, and then it's going to go almost straight back out. But I'm going to 
stop right around the edge of the uh, head here because instead of just following the line um, that I already have for the head, I could almost just imagine that it wasn't there, but I want the, uh, the compound eye to go past where you think the head would have gone because the eye bulges away from the edge of the head a little bit. Um, so we're going to do that same thing over here, and we're going to try and make sure that they stay nice and symmetrical. Um, that's one of the uh, fun and challenging things about drawing insects, is one side is always better than the other side. When you're drawing from a dorsal point of view, eyes happening. I feel like I want the right side to be maybe a little bigger. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry guys. I'm making it picky. Alright, um, behind these compound eyes where the head is going to meet the pronotum, um, that isn't just a straight line across, it's a little bit of a wave where it has its peak in the center. So right around here, you're going to have a wave that comes up, but this angle follows the underside of the eye at a little bit of a curve. Alright, comes up a little bit in between the eyes and then comes back around. So that's going to be our shape for our pronotum here um, and for the back of the head. These just connect up to our parallel compound eye, friends. And then if we were to zoom in right here to the front of the head, let me just go ahead and put this back. Oops, huh? Might as well put that back for now. Okay. All right. I'm going to zoom in. Maybe change the focus just a little bit. Go down. All right. So I wanted to focus a little bit on the frontal region of the head because this is where there is a lot of detail in the um, in the mouth parts and um, yeah um, there's just a lot of detail in the mouth parts and so I thought that that would be kind of a fun thing to look at now um, the actual head comes up here and then there is a lobe here that comes back and then one more lobe that comes out and around all right so that's the edge of the head um, up here on the left this kind of darker space that's gonna be the top of the mandible on the left and this one here is the top of the mandible on the right um, if you look right around here to drink 
um, some kind of the nectar, or they'll be going to, like, sap on trees to drink that, or, like, some fruit sometimes. Jewel beetles like to, when they're adults, um, just find the opportune, they're, like, opportunistic sugar lovers a lot of times. Um, but not all the time. There's a good number of them that feed on leaves, too. I just imagine that for this one because of all those hairs. Normally you see hairs like that in liquid uptake. Okay. That's all. My my little rant. I'm zooming out a little bit because I wanted to be able to see the base of those antenna. Sorry for Mrs. Peter. What's the location range on this lovely beetle. This specimen was collected in Malaysia. Um, I'm not sure how wide its distribution is. With beetles, does the distance between the compound eyes differ with gender? Um, not with these beetles. Um, I'm not sure if there are, if there is any species of beetles where the distance between the eye is the thing. I know that that's on some species of flies, right? Okay, robber flies? Robber flies? Okay, so along the front of these compound eyes that we're going to take, the head goes up just a little bit before we go off into these antenna. Um, I would call the scape, or the first segment of the antenna, um, this one right here. Um, this down here looks like an additional little segment, but I wonder if it's like a, an expanded antennal socket or something. Um, I can't imagine that that down there is the scape. Alright, so we've got that little bulbous guy down on the bottom. And small. And then the nice long first segment of the antenna, which is that scape. And I'm going to do that same thing on the other side, hopefully. Perfect. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. Actually, happier with the left and then on the right. That's going to be the running thing for this beetle. It's going to be better on the left. Good. All right, so from up here, we talked about that um, the actual head shape is kind of M up there in front um, and in between the antenna. And then we've got that labrum, L-A-B-R-U-M. That's kind of like that upper lip. And it looks like this. And it has all types of hair on it. That's what we were calling that little mustache that you can see. And then, those mandibles here, and here. So that's going to give you your head. Now all I have to do is add the uh, cross-hatching within the compound eye so that you can see the, all of the individual lenses. or what we would call omatidia. So that's what my beetle, my jewel beetle's head is going to look like. Um, I'm going to zoom out here and get a look for the entire um, antenna. Keep a stiff upper labrum, master beetle. <laughs> that's funny. good. Sometimes it's, it's tricky to get the antenna on the right plane so that all of the segments um, are in focus at the same time because um, you have to turn the beetle in a funny way sometimes. But this 
turned out pretty good, and I'm happy about that because this is, oh, if I hit the table too hard, the microscope shifts and then the image blurs. That's fun. All right, so, um, sorry, your screen just disappeared. There you are. Okay. Um, this antenna is what we would consider serrate spelled like this. And I do believe that is also, uh, I believe that that's also a word in plants. Um, it just means sawtooth shaped. So um, with this antenna, you can see off to one side it's sharp, but it's kind of more smooth along the other side. And so we would call that a serrate antenna. Um, the jewel beetles don't always have serrate antenna, but there are a good number of them that do um, look exactly like this. Some of them have really, uh, really significant um, serrations too, and the, those antenna get really unique. Alright, so for the length, for the overall length of the antenna, um, because now we can't see the specimen um, in its entirety, those antenna are not going to go past the length of the pronotum here. So they're going to stay kind of like this. Maybe even shorter than that, more like that. All uh, right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven segments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, so there are eleven segments here. We've got the first one. We do that's the scape. Give you all the words at one time so that I don't so that I can draw two. So that first segment is the scape. Um, it is the uh, the nice long one there. It's always the first segment of the antenna. The next one is the pedestal. Generally, it's a really, really tiny, small, itty-bitty segment. And it makes sense that the first segment is a little bit longer or wider or bigger to connect to the head. But the next segment... Be Due to the need for the antenna to be really flexible, the next segment is a lot of times very small because that gives a larger range of motion. <coughs> um, and the segment three is more like a rectangle, so let's say it is also a little bit shorter than the scape here. The rest of the antenna segments, three on on, are all the flagellum. And then bottom side stays smooth. I hope that I didn't lose you for too long. I think that my computer just said I disconnected on accident for a second. Let me know if there was anything significant that you missed. Um, I'm following this line to follow kind of the inside of the antenna. So we're going to go follow the line on the bottom. And then on the out, we're going to start narrow and go wide. Give it that triangle. Let's see. And I'm going to make the first one just a little bit longer. significantly smaller.
antenna for this beetle here. Um, I think that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Very good. So that's. Um, I think that he's doing. He's being pretty cute so far. So those are what Siri antenna look like. They um they tend to be still one of the trickier antenna types for me to draw because I think that getting all of those individual points um correct tends to be just more tricky for me. We can hear you now. Perfect. Now we're looking at the pronotum. And I'm going to make the, the hill between the compound eyes a little bit softer. Okay, so um, along the edges, I already have kind of my estimated kind of size, but I do want to notice that the top is more bulbous and the bottom has a little bit of a point or triangle at this edge. So when I'm coming back here, I'm going to start at the base of the head and give myself a convex arch that comes back to that center line, follows it down for a moment, and then swings out a little bit. We've got a little bit of an angle here. Um, that's rounded. Yeah, something like that. Pretty cool. Uh, right, so that's going to be the outside of the pronotum. And you want to make sure that it looks the same on the other side. And then along the bottom... It's going to come up but then back down at the center, and it's going to go past. So it's going to go up. Let's see, I'm going to find the center of my beetle. There it is. All right, so this center here, I'm going to estimate that that um, is going to come all the way down here, and then I want it to come up. something along those lines. So if you were going to describe the texture within the pronotum, how it has all of those little dots, like the little spots on those, on its, um, on the, um, outside of the exoskeleton, kind of like that structure, um, that texture is, um, we would call that punctate. Um, yeah, we would say, we would use punctate as the descriptive word. So we would say the pronotum is punctate, and, or we would call those punctations. Like the density of the punctations is blah, blah, blah. Might be a, might be a way you use it in a key. Alright, I do want you to note that the elytra is going to be cutting a corner of that bottom of the left pronotum off, so I'm not even going to bother to draw it because I know that it's going to be coming up through that. Alright, so that is what I... Oh no! I lost a camera. Okay, good. We're back. Do we say glandular punctations, or is that more of a plant thing? That is more of a plant thing. Uh, we wouldn't call them glandular. We would just call them punctations. 
Are there clans associated with punctations? With the punctations in the plants? You know, that would be my guess, is that the punctations in the plants have glands at the base of them, whereas a lot of times in, especially in beetles, the punctations are just, um, the, just a texture of the exoskeleton. They'll have these, like, little dots. Um, most of the times, most of the time, they are, are not for any type of glands or for, um, sensory. Every now and again, they do have sensory hairs coming out of the center of them, and then they're almost more like a socket for a sensory hair. Um, but that's not what these are. Those look more... Mm, when, there's, when it's more like a sensory hair coming out of a punctation, I guess how I would describe it is it looks like... Maybe it's a little deeper, it's a little bigger, I don't know, it just like, um, it makes a statement. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. These punctations are more like in the background. This would be like, one that was like stuck out, it was obvious it was noticeable. Um... Alrighty, so I'm trying to catch up on this glandular conversation. I do know that we call glandular punctations the oil. Okay. Oh, so Susan asked if the punctation arrangement and or density is consistent across individuals of the same species or do they differ? Generally, punctations are... Um, when you are looking at the density of punctations from, from individual to individual within a species, generally they are very, very similar. Um, the examples that I'd like to give are probably existent on the elytra. Let's go look at them for a minute. Yeah. wonder if I can get this nice and in focus. I'm not sure if this is going to come out this is what I, how I want it. Oh, you know what? That totally works. Okay, so um, this is the elytra of this beetle here, and we are talking about the density of punctations and if it's the same across individuals within the same species. Uh, you can see on the elytra of this beetle there are these, um, these ridges and then all of the punctations are in the um, are in the divot of the ridge. The ridge is free of punctations, and then the divots have more punctations. All right, and so you can see that all the way across. This is one ridge here. This is one ridge here, and there are ridges across the elytra. Um, so the density of these ones here is significant, obviously in comparison to where there aren't any at all. Um, and that density should also stay the same within individuals of the same species. Um, other beetles, like there are some click beetles that have their punctations are arranged in lines, in rows, and all of those within the same species have the same number of rows. Uh, so you can use that characteristic as a... Uh, um, to differentiate species. And sometimes it is used to differentiate species. I feel like recently I was identifying an ant that the difference in between the two were the punctations on the thorax. Mesonotum, maybe? Um... It, but is it black and blue or gold and white? Oh, that's funny. Susan, we're not going to go there. I feel like it looks it looks like black and blue, black and purple. Um, I love it. All right. 
let's get back to up here where the wings are coming, where the elytra are coming down. Actually, we might have to zoom in a little bit on the bottom of the pronotum first so that I can show you that guy. So, in between the elytra, there are, there is the scutellum. The scutellum tends to be like a little D or a little triangle that's right here in the center, um, in between the wings. But in this specimen, instead of it being a triangle, it's more of a diamond shape. You can see it right here. It starts right around here. It comes out to a point here, and then it comes back here. So that is the shape we're looking at when we say the scutellum. Um, the wing actually opens up around that. So this is where the elytra is going up and going out. That's why there's kind of this dark shadow here. And then this one is the one that is going down. Uh, this is that center line, and that really, really pretty metallic blue-purple color is the top of the ab that's the top of the thorax. All right, so right here along that bottom, I'm going to erase a lot of these little sketch lines that I don't need right now. Um, that is where I'm going to be putting my scutellum. Gets a little bit wider before it comes to down to a point. More of a point than that. The scutellum is actually pretty sharp at the bottom. It means it. Just make sure that it is on the center line of your beetle. Okay. And then there is a little bit of a space here and that you can't see on this side before it connects to the second segment of the thorax. So here's our elytra, starts here, comes up and around. That shoulder angle right there is what we call that humeral angle that we talked about earlier. I like to, um, sometimes when insect words remind me of human words, I like to share it. So when I think about our humorous, that's when we hit our funny bone, right? And uh, that is their humorous right here. It's the edge of the wing. I bet you it would hurt to be hit right there. Love it. Okay. 
when I go over to that screen, the camera is flipped upside down, so it always uh, messes with my brain. All right. That is our friend here. I actually, I brought him over because I wanted to see at, from the top what the edge of this elytra looked like. And right here at that white stripe, that's where this bulbous region comes out, and it's about broken up into even thirds. So it's one, two, three, and we already have these little like subdivision lines when we were measuring out that this was three times of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to about that one third point and then I'm gonna come up because it looks almost like it tucks in a little bit there so I'm gonna kind of roll that in and then start out here and I'm gonna make this kind of almost con I'm gonna make it convex out for about a third but not, don't make it really extreme, right? We're just kind of shaping this line here instead of just letting it stay flat. And then once you get back to that line, we're going to kind of create this more of a point. So it's going to narrow during that last third. And then this straight down the center. Now, what will differ between individuals within the same species is this border right here. So I'll show you this really quick. The border in between the blue and the light, the blue and the white, will change um, a little bit between individuals within the same species. So <coughs> um, there is a little bit of randomness happening here. It will always happen in approximately the same place, right? So there's always going to be a bit border between blue and white right around that third mark. But the different mountains and valleys in that line um, is going to be different um, in, in different individuals. It also is likely not going to be, <coughs> it's also likely not going to be the same, um, even symmetrical, even across from the left to the right on the same individual. Uh, that's one of those things that does stay pretty varied. So let's go and look at the other side and see if the other elytra uh, matches. Oh, that's going to be a little tricky because... It actually matches pretty well. So, um... I uh, took it out from under the microscope because that wasn't going to work. So let's look at it here for a minute. Um, over here on the left, you can see that it's kind of tall on the bottom left and it comes down. And it's the same on this side, kind of tall and then comes down. So I guess on a micro level, they're not going to be the same. But from far away, they actually are pretty close. With the original, oh. Are there still punctations in the white section? Yes, there are punctations still within the white section. It's just more difficult for um, the microscope to pick those up. Hi, Dr. Victor Fursov. Welcome. I am so happy that you're joining us today. We are about to check out the way that this um, jewel beetle's wings fold up underneath the elytra. Um, I'm just trying to get a decent image of the way the wing is folding out. I'm pretty happy with that. <coughs> so, uh, Dr. Fursov, what do you, um, what is your focus? Is it um, specifically on um, Apis mellifera, or do you um, have other buggy passions? All right. 
this is our elytra here, and it's opened up to, to show off that wing underneath. And I might be able to shorten this wing a little bit, and if I do, maybe I can get the, uh, the membranous wing to fit on this page. I'd love to see that happen. All right, so if I was going to take this wing and make it symmetrical on the other side, I might use a ruler. No, oh, you know what? My estimate was pretty pretty spot on, actually. All right, so from here, the, the straight line is the one that I want to follow, right? So instead of... Um, Instead of this elytra coming just straight down, we're going to come from the corner and go straight out to the point right around here. And then the outside of the elytra, all we have to do is kind of match this one. So keep in mind, we're still working in those thirds. Let's get the rounded humeral angle up here. Round it out. And then we're going to subdivide this approximately into thirds, and that's going to be where that white stripe is, too. So that's a double reason to get that marked in there. All right, so for the first third, it's going to come out and then come back a little bit. And then you've got this until the last, where it gets a little bit narrower and then rounds down. Cool! Awesome! So that is going to be the elytra nice and open. And what I'm going to do is darken some of these, get myself this line. So we've got the elytra taken care of. There's a couple more things that we do want to look at. We want to look at the membranous wing that's coming out to let our beetle fly. And then we're going to look at the underside of the body here. Um, if you did want, we could still draw the legs on the right hand side. The legs on the left are going to be too much with these wings. So I guess that's a question to you while I'm getting this, um, the membranous wing situated. Uh, would you like to draw the legs on the right hand side um, and try and get a view of our legs once we're done? Or are you happy with our beetle kind of the having its legs kind of tucked underneath it? This beetle would, um, if it was scared um, and you picked it up off of a plant or you found it on a leaf and you picked it up, it would tuck in its legs and, and fall. So um, having not being able to see its legs is a natural pose for this beetle. something and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to but I'm going to try cool all right awesome did it so um I love this angle here. I wanted to show it to you really quick. Um, and this is underneath the elytra. So actually something that we're not going to be able to see from the top, but I wanted to show it to you any way because I think that it might clear some stuff up as to why the wing looks like it's longer than the body. Because this a lot of beetles, like ladybugs for instance, their membranous wing tucks and then 
ten folds underneath the elytra. This beetle, um, it doesn't have that kind of center fold that you would see in a lot of other beetles. Um, but when we look here at the base of the wing, it's kind of connected almost on um, like a, a small narrow region. And then the wing kind of folds out from there. So when we're looking at it from this side, you're not going to be able to see that as well. But if we, that's what we're doing is we're turning it this way because I want to show you that there is that space in between the wing and the edge of the abdomen. It kind of folds out there. Nifty. Nifty, nifty, nifty. And I wrote membranous up there because what we're looking at is the membranous wing. So this is what it looks like in reality from the top. And I will go ahead and move it off to the left, too. So, I want to imagine where the body is. Okay. So that's where my the body of the beetle is going to be. It might have to be a little bit lighter. And then for the hind wing, I just want to make sure that it's not touching this body. So it's got to be a little bit separate. It's going to come down and out. And then that is going to be the angle that kind of comes up. And you will be able you'll be able to fit yours on your paper. Uh, mine is going to be just going over, but this is what the end of the wing looks like. So from here, that's what that is. So starting from here, it comes out, comes down, and then Yeah, it's going to go like an inch and a half over my paper. So what I'm going to do is you still have uh, you still have the same types of wing venation that we've talked before in like butterfly wings. So that top vein up there that's really dark, the strongest vein in your wing, um, that's going to be the costa. You do have a little bit of a sub costa, that vein that's just kind of under, that's just underneath it. Um, looks like we've got some fanning veins in here. Cool. Alright, so that gives me just a little bit of wing venation on this wing here. He's so cool. I'm so happy with him. Alright, now I want to zoom in on the underside. We're going to be looking right here. Un what it looks like underneath the elytra when the wing is kind of folded down there. So we're just going to move down the body from from the up from top to down. Uh, here in this kind of first region, this is still the top of the thorax here. 
it's too far down. It exists above that first blue line. All right, so that's the that's gonna be the top of the thorax, and then when we go down a little bit further, that's actually where you can see the wing starting. Alright, so where there is this little, what looks like a little orangish band here, that's the start of the abdomen. So these segments here are abdominal segments. Um, if you see them in an insect key or anything like that, they are just labeled A1 through whatever. Um, in this beetle, it, nah, I'm not going to be able to count at this very moment. There's a good number of them. At a really quick glance, it looked like six or eight segments, but I didn't count. Um, so there's many segments, and you would count it from the thorax to the end of the abdomen. But if we look really, really close, right about here, right about there, right about somewhere down here, I believe that we can see the spiracles. So I want to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in and see if I can get them all focused for you, or at least see one of them. tricky on this metallic colors to get a good view of this guy. It's a really pretty light show, but it's uh, it's not work. Oh, you know what? That is almost the best view I'm going to be able to get you, and I'm sorry about that one. But if you look right about right about here, there looks like there's this. It almost looks like a little um like a little sliver right there. Uh, that, I believe, is one of the spiracles. There's a series of spiracles along the top side of the abdomen, and um, when I'm drawing my the top of my abdomen, I'll kind of point it out as I'm, as I'm drawing them so you can see where exactly they are and on what segments. But um, the being able to see things in person is always just a little bit better than having a camera. So um, I can actually see the inside side of these spiracles a little bit, or see that there's like these little itty bitty hairs on the inside, but that they are closed right now, and it looks like they could have muscles that open them up like this. So they're sitting like this, really kind of narrow, but when the insect is breathing alive, happy, it, they probably open up like this, and then they close. Um, so I wanted to show you that.
right, we're back. side of the abdomen here. Um, the wing, like we saw on this side, is a peg that comes down. So there's this little bit of a peg, so it kind of comes up, and then there's this little bit of a, um, so if we were imagining in it, in, bloop, if we were imagining it here, it's connected up here, but it goes down a little bit, and then it comes out and goes across. And it looks like it only goes about, about two-thirds of the way over. It doesn't it doesn't cover the entire abdomen. So you can see it comes out to about here. Um, and then it's going to go all the way. A little bit less. All right. So that's going to be the top side of the wing. It's going to stay pretty parallel until you get to that second third. And, um, and then we'll swoosh this down. It almost looks like scales on the butterfly wing. I can almost, I can almost see that. It reflects light very similar to the scales on a butterfly's wing is what I mean. Um, I like that. Because the structure is very different, but the uh, but the way that it kind of bounces back is very similar. All right, so this is going to come down, but then once you've gotten to this kind of halfway point, looks like the abdomen is also starting to narrow significantly. I didn't narrow the abdomen as much as I should have, starting about there. All right, so now as we're bringing this wing down, we get to that point where the abdomen is starting to narrow and the wing is just going to come all the way, almost all the way down to the very end. And it never actually overlaps the edge of that wing, it never the edge of the abdomen, and it never actually covers it either. It just kind of gets super duper close at the end. And then disappears under the elytra. Alright, for now we've got that wing all taken care of. These veins, if you imagine them coming up and folding, these veins end up going in this direction. So it does have some veins that come down in this way, if you'd like to add those. with me. Just know that when I look through the microscope, it's not always in focus for the camera. My eyes are a little different than the camera. Um, from this image. I just want to make sure that I'm outlining them for you. So that first 
So the first um, segment of the abdomen is right about here, and it ends just above this orange line. It comes down here, so that's one. And then two comes right around here. Two is here. Three is here. And then we can see four. And then five is off of the screen. So we can see the first four abdominal segments when we're looking at this white stripe. So one, two, three, four four and the start of five, but you can't see the end of it yet. So if I was going to start here and I was looking at just that white line, that's going to help guide us. We also have this light line here to help us along the way. So we're going to go the first abdominal segment comes actually a little bit out at an angle. It's a little higher on the right than at the left. So that's going to be one. And then we have two. There is a spiracle on the top of the second abdominal segment. So I'm going to draw that little, that flat oval right there at the top. That's our little spiracle. Um, that's a breathing hole. So they open to, to breathe and insects don't have lungs to store oxygen. They actually have to dissolve the oxygen. They have a, um, they just kind of open the windows to their body and they allow the oxygen to flow in and out of their body. It's interesting. The third segment So the first three segments here don't have much of um, don't have much of angles or points off on the edges. Um, some of these are going to be pretty sharp, um, but three also has a spiracle up here on the top. Four is the first one with a little bit of a point, and the point is on the bottom. So we're going to come out here. We're going to give it just a little bit of a point. On the, on the bottom of that segment. And there's also a spiracle there. Alright, now it's at this point that I'm going to move our microscope because you can see we're right about there at the edge of the white. The fifth segment is starting, but we can't see the bottom of it on our microscope. Um, that point on the outside of the fourth segment is right there, that little point guy. Alright. So this is going to be our second view for the abdomen, and it looks like we will be able to see enough of the rest. So, um, segment number five is coming from the inside of that point, so you can give a little bit of like a, you can give a little bit of space to that point, and then it's going to come out just a little bit past, and then you're going to cut back in. Segment number five has this 
really pretty point on the edge and is going to be a little bit lower than the edge of this white line here. I see most of these abdominal segments have spiracles. It looks like it's about one on every segment. The first one didn't have one. I'm wondering where they're on, where they will end. All right, so now we have one more segment that gets that very pointed edge before we go smooth again. So we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four more segments to do. So one more that has a point, we're going to come out, create that point, and then bring it back in. Still kind of following the edge of the abdomen like we had planned. Um, and then we have three more segments. Two of them are more straight, so I'm just going to take this from the inside of the point, and I'm going to bring it down about here and then just subdivide it because those two are pretty even with one another and then at the very end instead of it just coming down as a tip there actually looks like the end of the abdomen is more rounded down for a last little bit and um, I'm going to show you the tip of the elytra because there's something cool happening here. Uh, see if I can get it over light a little bit better. So this shows you that last of segment on that abdomen and the very very inside edge of the elytra has a very sharp point i'm gonna fix that on my guy a little bit i'm gonna give it a really kind of sharp point right there at the end and then come in a little bit i think that's a cute little detail for the elytra and you can do it on both sides to make them look even and super cute interpret these body parts for us. It's really hard to make sense of the microscope camera with the darkness and iridescence. Yeah, I am, um, sorry about that. I try my hardest to get the lighting, um, to get the lighting right for these specimens, but some of them are a little trickier, and I would rather share them with you and translate than skip them in general. And I do want to answer that final question for us, and that was how many of these segments have spiracles. It is from two, 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 three, four, five, six, seven. Um, at A, two through seven have visible spiracles. I wonder about aquatic beetles whose elytra clamp down so nicely to make them streamlined in shape. Would that prevent them being able to breathe above water unless they open their wings? Um, the answer is no. Um, because the abdomen is not directly connected to the wings and they have muscles in their abdomen. So instead of opening their wings, they can just fold their abdomen down a little bit. Um, some beetles, like tenline June beetles, they have an abdomen that moves a little bit, but the way that the abdomen moves, it stridulates. It scratches up against the, um, the bottom side of the elytra, and that's how they make a squeaking noise. They can go squeak, 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 squeak between their abdomen and their elytra. Now, <laughs> um, with whirligig beetles, like um, the, any type of uh, like a diving beetle, 
Um, they do hold an air pocket underneath their elytra, between their elytra and their abdomen. So they would um, come up to the surface. They um, can kind of tip open their um, tip open their abdomen just a little bit. Allow a water allow an air pocket to fill in. Um, hold their abdomen back up, and that's when they dive, dive, dive. Um, and so they can use that air pocket hidden underneath their wings to breathe. Um, that's awesome, and then it does become an issue when you are a female diving beetle, because then you only have a limited supply of oxygen. Good questions, good questions. Love them so much. <sighs> Alrighty, so, um... If you want to continue on the uh, on the tropical insects side of things, um, I do have the ability to continue doing tropicals. Um, I have recently pinned some um, cool tropical metallic dung beetles uh, that we could draw, or um, I can get some more out for us. Uh, we could do like a species of walking stick or a uh, or a praying mantis. Does anyone have a thought as to what we should be drawing next week? Or opinions? I already have the dung beetles ready, so I guess we'll do dung beetles unless anybody else has um, another suggestion. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and come down here. Woo, backwards. Love it. Alright, so this is what my beetle looks like in its entirety. I did not go through and add the punctations or the, the punctations or the ridges along the elytra or on the pronotum. Um... Down for dung beetles. Ooh, I love a good dung beetle. Perfect. We're doing dung beetles. That'll be fabulous. Um, that is how my jewel beetle turned up. Chrysocroa, um, Chrysocroa Castle Naughty. That's fun. I love that. Awesome. So, I hope that you all had a fantabulous time hanging out with me. Um, drawing this beetle here. Uh, I do teach classes on a platform called OutSchool. It is a platform where I teach student ages, so 5 to 8, 9 to 12, 13 to 18 high school level entomology classes. Um, if you follow the little description on the bottom, um, you can get $20 worth of free, class pl free classes. So you can come in um, if you know a, a niece or a nephew or a grandchild or anybody who's interested in bugs, send them the link and they can get some free classes from me and see if they like it. Um, over here is your reminder to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Luckily all of you have already done so because you're chatting with me in the chat box and I appreciate that. Um, over on the bottom right, that, oh, this is a green, <laughs> um, over there on the bottom right, uh, is the QR code that links directly to my PayPal account, um, that is where you can donate to Insectopia, my small business, help me, um, continue to travel and teach and, um, uh, build this collection so that I can, um, continue to teach you too. Yay! Um, as always, I have started making sure to share your sketches and your beautiful drawings on my Facebook page. So if you want me to share that over there, I you can go ahead and email me, um, Trisha at theinsectopia.com. And there's a part of me, I wonder if I just create a post on my Facebook page where it has my drawing on the top. You could also go in and share your drawing underneath. That could be a cool thing to start doing if you wanna if you wanna try that out. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and start. Um, and if you want, you can just go ahead and take a picture of your drawing as it is right now, or um, go and finish coloring uh, depending on uh, your style. 
and then post your image when it's complete on the uh, little post on my Facebook page. How about that? That sounds fun. If you don't know where my Facebook page is, you can search at Insectopia2015. That's my tag on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, and if you're not on Facebook or Instagram, you can email it to me. Alright, I hope that you all have a fabulous rest of your week and stay buggy. I'll see you on Facebook.